Tonight, a 17-year-old girl has died after being struck by a vehicle in Scarborough. She's my neighbor. She grew up in front of us whole life. A community in shock and mourning. The victim, a student of the high school just down the street from where she was hit near Birchmount and Danforth. Plus, it's really about what the medical experts say. If they say it's safe, then I would absolutely get him vaccinated. As we wait to see if Health Canada will approve Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine for children under 12, how do parents feel about it? And she's had, like I said, a pretty rough year, as everyone has. Um, she just had a, you know, a little bit rougher than most. But things may be turning around for Fanny, the three-legged dog. She's just been chosen to be in a new pet calendar featuring animals that struggle with mobility. We'll have her incredible story. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. A Scarborough community is in mourning tonight after a 17-year-old girl was struck and killed by the driver of a vehicle near Birchmount Road and Danforth Avenue. The victim was a grade 12 student at Birchmount Park Collegiate and was struck just down the street from the high school. Ardell Manakduk has more. It didn't take long for members of the community to come by and drop flowers. She grew up in front of us, she is our neighbor. And I am, after I heard this message about one hour ago, <laughs> Mohammed Mamanul Haq lives in the same apartment building as the young woman, just a kilometer away from the collision. He says she lived with her mother. Very nice. Always laughing face, always respectful to elder. Uh, it's very pathetic how she got this accident. Police say she was walking northbound at the crosswalk around 11.45 this morning. The driver of this gray Dodge Caravan was heading south on Birchmount, turning left on Danforth and struck the girl. That young woman is a 17-year-old um, who, uh, and I can confirm at this time, is a student from uh, Birchmount uh, Collegiate, which is uh, just down the street from us. Several people stopped and tried to help, including directing traffic to protect the victim from other vehicles before first responders arrived. She was rushed uh, via ambulance um, uh, by emergency run to a local trauma center uh, and has unfortunately and, and very tragically been pronounced deceased. Police have been in contact with the principal at Birchmount Collegiate. They say the school is taking steps to address the tragedy and help students through the difficult situation. The driver of the minivan remained at the scene and was transported to a hospital in shock. Police are still investigating whether the driver was impaired or if speed or distracted driving was a factor. Dale Manukduk, CBC News, Toronto. Another pedestrian fatality on our roads tonight near O'Connor Drive and Pape Avenue. It happened just after 9.30. Police say a person was struck and was trapped under the vehicle. They were pronounced dead at the scene. Traffic services are investigating. Roads in the area will be closed overnight. Residents near High Park held a vigil this afternoon in honor of a couple killed in a five-vehicle crash last week. They are demanding action from the city, calling for more safety measures along Parkside Drive. How does someone die in a vehicle accident on a 50-kilometer-per-hour road? The crash happened near Spring Road and Parkside Drive last Tuesday. The driver of a BMW traveling at high speed collided with a Toyota that was waiting in traffic. The collision caused a chain reaction with three other vehicles crashing into each other. 69-year-old Fatima Avila and 71-year-old Valdemar Avila were killed in the crash. Three others were injured. No charges have been laid at this time, but police are still investigating. One local councillor says better safety measures are needed in the area. We're all we're all heartbroken. This is this is something that could have been avoided. We're uh, talking about trying to get sidewalks on on part of this, this street here. We're trying to get the speed reduced. I've been in conversations with city staff to make this 40 instead of 50. But also, it's a plea to everybody who drives a car. You know, I know you're in a hurry to get where you're going, but remember, you're driving through somebody's neighborhood. Residents have organized a peaceful protest for next Tuesday with a march down Parkside Drive. They're calling on local politicians to prioritize road safety and reminding drivers to slow down. 
As we reported yesterday, Pfizer has asked Health Canada to approve its COVID-19 vaccine for children aged 5 to 11. It would be the first COVID vaccine for children under 12. And tonight, we're hearing from parents about what they think. Chris Clever has more. It took convincing for Arafat Jahan Bashar to get a COVID shot. I was a person I didn't want to take the vaccine. I just totally was negative about it. Now she's vaccinated and wants it for her three-year-old and six-year-old daughters. If the younger kids get the, some kind of protection against this virus, I think it's a good thing. She may soon be in luck for her six-year-old. Health Canada is reviewing Pfizer's request to approve COVID vaccines for kids 5 to 11. That means that possibly in the future, instead of having a, a large fifth wave, um, that there could be, you know, slowly an end to this. Pediatric infectious disease expert Dr. Anna Banerjee says schools represent the largest congregate setting of unvaccinated people and COVID vaccine side effects in children are extremely rare. Still, a recent poll by Angus Reid found only about half of parents with kids aged 5 to 11 would get their kids vaccinated right away. I'm concerned for the kids if what they feel if they have a vaccine for that. Combine that vaccine fear with the fact that severe COVID illness in kids is very rare. In this fourth wave, kids under 12 account for eight hospitalizations in Toronto, one in ICU. Compare that to 149 COVID hospitalizations in people 50 to 69, 40 of them in intensive care. But Dr. Banerjee says vaccinating kids is about outbreak management. It's really everything, uh, protecting that child and the community and the school. COVID is a really scary thing and I want to protect myself, protect my son and, and my family and those people around us as well. That's a message that sunk in with mom, Lisa Ray. It's really about what the medical experts say. If they say it's safe, then I would absolutely get him vaccinated. We will be ready to go as soon as Health Canada gives it a go. Health Minister Christine Elliott says public health units are already prepping rollout plans. But opposition leader Andrea Horvath points out parents of young kids in B.C. can already pre-register. They're making sure that their system is ready. Parents have some certainty already uh, as to what to expect. But here we are uh, still with NADA. Whatever the plan, it may swing into action soon. Health Canada says it's prioritizing its review of Pfizer's request. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. A school in Etobicoke has reopened its doors after being shut down due to COVID-19. Silverthorne Collegiate was the first TDSB school this year to close because of an outbreak. Students stay, say they're glad to be back. It's exciting. We've yeah. been online and it's been hard. I'm very excited to return to school because uh, I can interact with my teacher better. Trust my teachers, and they're always pretty clean inside the room. So we always have sanitizer stations and everything, so I think I'm safe. I mean, they wouldn't say it's good to come back unless it was safe. Toronto Public Health shut down Silverthorne Collegiate last Tuesday after 11 students tested positive for COVID-19. But after an investigation indicated student-to-student -student spread seems to have stopped, the school was given the all-clear to reopen. The TDSB says Toronto Public Health hasn't advised of any additional precautions to be taken at the school. Stringent health and safety measures remain in place, whether it be masking, physical distancing, we have HEPA filters in classrooms. One additional thing that we are doing at Silverthorne is offering uh, rapid antigen tests to make sure that if any COVID cases do manage to get in, uh, that they're caught early on. Another school, though, remains closed. Green Home Junior Middle School in Rexdale has 11 student cases and a staff member with COVID-19. It's unclear when that school will reopen. Meteorologist Colette Kennedy joins us now with a first look at the forecast. And Colette, we had a beautiful sunny day with some warmer temperatures. Yeah, it's just such a phenomenal day. I mean, hard to complain. If you were really trying hard, maybe you'd say those westerly winds were just a bit too blustery at times, but come on. Uh, these are some of the numbers in terms of the daytime highs then. Yeah, some upper teens further east into Ontario that you went, but 22 for Windsor and Toronto, Oshawa, Hamilton, St. Catharines and London. All 21 degrees this afternoon with all of that sunshine. And we keep the clear conditions tonight and the westerly winds, although they'll be a bit lighter 
here. So that's going to keep the temperatures up from where they were last night. So it won't be as cool tomorrow morning as it was this morning. Now, the slimmest chance of an isolated shower into the afternoon as this warm front is moving through. I think primarily we'll just see some increase in cloudiness. You might get a bit of a sprinkle in there. We're really going to be still in that warm slot with mild temperatures. Greater chance will be towards eastern Ontario and into cottage country of getting into some wet conditions. We will too eventually. I'm just saying it's probably going to take until we get towards Wednesday night to see a greater chance of that and Thursday. And I'll talk more about that coming up overnight tonight, though 12 degrees and tomorrow increasing cloudiness and 21 for that high. Thanks, Colette. Premier Doug Ford is facing calls to apologize over comments he made about immigrants yesterday. Opposition parties and critics say his comments are hurtful and play to stereotypes. But the Premier isn't backing down, saying he's always been pro-immigration. Lorena Redekop reports. His comments were callous, discriminatory, dismissive and offensive to thousands of immigrants. Will the Premier apologize for his reckless comments? But Premier Doug Ford says he has nothing to be sorry about. I am pro-immigration. I have been pro-immigration from day one. Ford's comments came yesterday while he spoke about the shortage of workers in the province and put out the call to potential newcomers. You come here like every other new Canadian has come here. You work your tail off. If you think you're coming to collect the dole and sit around, not going to happen. Go somewhere else. I was just shocked that he would say that. This communication specialist tweeted a response, calling it a disgrace. She showed the photo of a long-term care worker who died of COVID. Maureen Ambersley was an immigrant from Jamaica. I was really enraged when I got up this morning and I thought about all we have gone through during the pandemic, all of the frontline workers, many of whom who are immigrants who died while doing their jobs, while quote unquote working their tails off and how disrespectful it is to say something like this, this kind of stereotype, this notion that people come or immigrants come to, you know, collect the dole or get a free ride. It's, it's ridiculous. The premier says his phone is blowing up with messages backing him, including from many immigrants. He suggested people visit Ford Fest, the annual barbecue his family holds, to see that support. I'll tell you how Ford Nation was created. They came to this country. They couldn't get a hold of any NDP Liberal leaders, but they got a hold of the Mayor of Toronto. They got a hold of the Premier. We show up to their door. We return their call. They deserve, deserved an apology, and instead they got a, an invitation to Ford Fest, and that's just not acceptable. The leaders of all three opposition parties say the Premier needs to back down from the comments. It doesn't show weakness to apologize when you make a mistake. I think it actually shows strength, and I think what he said was was incredibly hurtful to lots of Ontarians. Imagine a child of new Canadians hearing their premier suggesting that they or their parents, family, don't work hard. Like, that's just the wrong message to send. The organization Canadians United Against Hate also demanded an apology, calling Ford's words dangerous, saying they feed into decades-old stereotypes about immigrants and give ammunition to racists. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. For anyone heading to Scotiabank Arena for the Raptors home opener tomorrow, you'll have some new food options. Scotiabank is introducing seven new concession stands. Be amongst these wonderful, talented chefs and be included in the program this year is, is all, it's very flattering and humbling. It's, it's after the two years that we've had uh, with, you know, coming out of the pandemic, it's, uh, it's a fantastic opportunity. Cherry Street Barbecue will be offering its Frito Pie. Also joining the list are Toronto-based restaurants Alouette, which will serve up its famous poached shrimp rolls. And for cheese lovers, there's the Cheese Boutique. Lila's is also new to the arena, serving up Trinidadian cuisine. There's also Noodle Bao, a MLSC establishment, and Colibri, bringing a taste of Mexican food. Finally, there's Poutinery, another MLSC establishment, bringing unique poutine options to the concourse. And there's a new ex exhibit opening at the Royal Ontario Museum this weekend. It is the ROM's first ever crowdsourced exhibition. And it centers on seeing the pandemic through the eyes of young people. Telly Ricci checks it out. At first glance, they may seem like whimsical children's drawings. But a closer look reveals more. The emotions young people have been carrying during the pandemic. The most common uh, emotion expressed with blue is sadness, but rather than expressing sadness with it, I wanted to uh, express confusion. 
Toronto's Royal Ontario Museum received more than 2,000 submissions for the exhibition My Pandemic Story, with mediums ranging from spoken word to dance and painting. Salsabel Mazumber's piece is digital art. During the pandemic, I had a lot of time to be by myself, so I did a lot of self-reflection. I really saw myself through the mirror as a boy wearing a woman's costume. This is my pandemic story submission. This is the coronavirus, and it ate all my favorite things, like school, traveling, basketball, and birthday parties. The ROM says this is its first crowdsource exhibition and one of the few pandemic-related exhibitions worldwide to focus on children's perspectives. We got excited about hearing the voices of, of uh, children through their experiences. We really saw people kind of working through a lot of their issues. Hannah Choi says her experience was difficult to put into words. Art helped capture it. My friends and family seemed so close to me, almost as if I could literally like reach through my screen and touch them, but that really isn't the case. Mazumber says seeing their art on display in a museum feels surreal. If there are other kids and teens coming to see this exhibition, they may be able to see a part of themselves within any of these art pieces made by kids for kids. And hoping their pieces bring others comfort. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. You're looking at a live shot of the Toronto skyline, mostly clear tonight with some cloudy periods developing overnight. Temperatures milder than the last few nights. It's currently 18 degrees in the city. Let's go back to Colette now with a look at your extended forecast. And Colette, we can expect more of the same tomorrow, but then another shift with the temperatures. Yeah, it's going to be a big shift when it comes, but it's so exciting to have another day on tap where we're going to see those temperatures well above seasonal and uh, we're going to put a two in it <laughs> once again for that double digit number for the daytime high. Even mild through the overnight, mostly clear. There's going to be a time like, you know, three, four, where we get kind of a batch of some clouds that come in, but they push back out. So mostly clear tonight. That's a bonus day of another warm one on Wednesday. And then we are going to be seeing uh, some wet conditions coming in and continuing really Thursday is going to be the wet day and the transition day and then after that it kind of opens the door uh, on that cooler air that's going to move in for Friday and into the weekend. So we have the warm front that's pushing in. I was showing you a little earlier in the show some cloud cover along that but only a little bit, not a lot to be worried about. We'll get into a bit more cloud. First, just some high thin clouds, so still a bright sky and sunshine, and then more develops through the day. And as that front comes in and intensifies, we'll see some heavier rains moving to the northeast and east of the GTA, so into eastern Ontario. A few isolated showers, but overnight Thursday, Wednesday, pardon me, into Thursday, we get into more widespread showery activity and some heavier downpours at times, but really it's going to come in kind of parcels so we'll get some dry times as well and then behind that yeah some clouds those will move away and then the cooler air comes so for tonight seven degrees for you in southwestern Ontario mild not as mild as we'll see towards Lake Ontario the highs tomorrow pretty terrific if I do say so and to look at tomorrow hey or overnight tonight 10 to 13 for the overnight lows like these are going to be what our daytime highs are in a few days. There you go. How about that tomorrow with that southwesterly breeze. So if you're close to the lake or you get into that southwesterly breeze, a few of the numbers are just a little bit lower transition with those temperatures Thursday. That's where we get that high around 15, 16. And then your eyes do not deceive you. Here comes that adjustment Friday through Sunday with those highs, barely double digits. And those lows are going to be some chillier, chillier year starts more like fall hey that's what we are in after all exactly thanks so much a sharp-eyed amateur diver made a surprising discovery in the mediterranean sea it's a find that you'd usually hear about in fairy tales and legends actually it's 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 heavy it's iron uh, uh, sword and very big one that's mean that the guy that hold this uh, a sword and fight with it was very strong. This sword, believed to be about 900 years old, was recovered from waters off northern Israel. The meter long blade, hilt, and handle are encrusted with marine life. The Israel Antiquities Authority plans to clean and restore this ancient sword so it can be put on display, which means any mythical dragons and sea monsters out there should be able to breathe easy. 
Well, like many of us, Fanny the three-legged dog hasn't had an easy year, but it does have one bright spot. She'll be featured in the 2022 Walkin' Pets calendar, which highlights animals from around the world who need mobility aids. We caught up with Fanny and her owner to talk about her pup's incredible story. Come on. She's had a pretty rough year, as everyone has. Um, she just had a, you know, a little bit rougher than most. Come on. <laughs> My name is Kristen, and this is Fanny. She is a five-year-old wire-haired pointing griffon. Fanny just won a place in the Walk and Pets 2022 calendar, a calendar focused on dogs who, and cats and cows, uh, who need assistance with their mobility. So Fanny uses a four-wheeled wheelchair at this point. Okay, Fanny, here's your wheelchair. I follow Walk and Pets on their social media, and they posted that they were taking entries for their calendar for next year. And I thought Fanny was pretty photogenic, and she benefited so much from the wheelchair itself through her recovery from her accident that I thought it would be great to get the word out about these products as well. You know, it was it was a good thing for her to do. In November of last year, she was upstairs in a, a friend's loft. She was frightened by an Amber Alert. She only has three legs, but she managed to still climb up and out a window, and she fell roughly about 50 feet. She fractured her vertebrae in five places, and she fractured a few smaller bones in her one front leg that she still has, and um, she was quite critical. She was put on supportive oxygen, and she was in the ICU for a little over three weeks. And she managed to get out and get home just before Christmas, uh, which was great. She was just a lot of time in recuperation with a back brace and a lot of therapy and a lot of rehab. Trying to recover a dog with a broken back is difficult. Trying to recover a dog missing a front leg with a broken back is multitudes more difficult because of the bouncing they have to do to walk. They're not very stable in the first place. So that chair was a godsend for us because it kept her stable, it kept her steady, and it gave her that, that, that support she needed to recover. And that's our show. Thanks for watching. Have a great night, everyone.